in addition to the new user interface and design of ITB2, a big part of it was removing the old libraries. And there was a concern early on from institutions that their plugins that people have been building over many years would no longer work. So a lot of emphasis was put in the new web client to be able to have legacy support for the old plugins. Um, so that in general should be working for institutions, but there's also a new framework to have new uh, new uh, plugins that are built leveraging modern um, capabilities of, uh, of web uh, of internet browsers today. So Nick is going to walk through a very technical discussion exactly how you would build a new plugin for I2B2 or think about transforming um, your old plugins into the new uh, framework. Good. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Griffin. Uh, so I hope we're not all too sleepy after that wonderful food. Uh, we do have some cool technical stuff that we're going to be going over today. Some really cool technical stuff that we're going to be going over today. Uh, basically, how to build a plugin using the new plugin technologies that the uh, new 1.8.0 web client gives you the ability to do. Uh, that is different. We do have legacy capabilities, but this new uh, way of doing it uh, is much more advanced, it gives you a lot more capabilities, gives you the ability to do any type of framework that you want without having your code and other plugins code intermingle and mess things up. So let's move forward. So uh, what is a plugin? It's basically uh, somebody wants a piece of functionality that does not exist in the web client currently. They can go ahead and get a developer on that and they can build it themselves. Uh, there's a lot of support in the environment that plugins operate within. Uh, the modern plugin design runs within iframes. Uh, so that in English means that uh, everything is compartmentalized and uh, isolated from one another. So you're not gonna have conflicts. Um, most interactions are gonna be when uh, you do drag drop operations from uh, the client dragging and dropping a, a piece of data from somewhere else in the user interface onto your plugin. And that's how you're going to interact with it, uh, the vast majority of uh, users. Um, and then also you're going to be calling back to the back end server, the I2B2 uh, hive to get information that's necessary uh, for you to do visualizations or whatnot. And uh, like I said before, uh, because of the way it's been designed for the new web client, uh, you have complete freedom to use any and all support libraries. You can even have the same support libraries as the second plugin but different versions. And because they're isolated within iframes, you're not gonna have those versions conflict with each other and cause issues where you can run one plugin but not the other or vice versa. Uh, so I talked a little bit about it. The uh, plugins run within a framework, a plugin framework. Uh, they're isolated iframes uh, and they communicate with the main user interface and exchange data using message pass, uh, passing techniques. Uh, drag drop operations are enabled by something called the SDX system or standard data exchange functionality, which is uh, a piece of well-engineered uh, code from the original I2B2 web client that created the plugin capabilities from version 1.0 of the web client. So it's uh, there present and it still works the same way and it does not have any problems. Uh, did not have to redo that. So uh, communications with the server is accomplished by Ajax within the uh, iframe that your plugin is working with. You're gonna have access to an I2B2 namespace and it's gonna have all the Ajax calls uh, that you can make to the backend service uh, for the I2B2 hive. Uh, we also have state management. So you have the ability to save state. So if you want to take the uh, plugin and drag in and drop it to a different location on your user interface, you'll be able to do that. Uh, it does lose state because of the way that all browsers operate, but 
if you're using the state variables correctly, it should just load itself back up when it reloads in the new position. And then also we have something uh, called an authorized tunnel. So we've taken a very serious look at security when we've done this new web client and we've locked it down quite a bit. We don't trust code, it's very compartmentalized. But if you do need to have your plugin reach out and do something with the main user interface, you can configure it so that it can reach through this tunnel and get access to uh, protected variables within the main uh, UI or execute function calls within the main user interface. So let's make a plugin. Uh, and let me just jump to a plugin that was recently deployed. Um, so uh, some of you may have seen this on a call, but uh, we have a Venn patient set Venn diagram uh, plugin. And what that does is it allows you to use a Venn diagram to see patient population overlaps uh, between different cohorts. And one thing that I can do, uh, I've done some queries uh, previously. We grabbed the patient set from our previously run queries, so drop that in. And we have a circle representing um, 10 patients. Uh, we go ahead to the next one, male. Drag and drop that in. And now we have males, 82 males selected from the data set, uh, 10 autistic patients. And the overlap is there are seven male autistic disorder patients. And if we wanted to go a little bit further, we can also expand out um, several, several patient sets. Uh, in this example, I'll just give three. And we have female. And we can see there are 51 female patients. And of that, three have autism. And autism is 10 in total, seven there with male overlaps. And that's how the Venn diagram plugin works. And I'm going to show you guys how to build this in a very hackish, hacker, fast coding way. I know I haven't had enough Red Bull to go very fast, but you should be thankful for that. Uh, so we see the, the plugin. One of the first things that we're going to need to do to build a plugin is we're going to have to get something in here. Uh, so this is the list of plugins. And in order to make that plugin, uh, we need to register it. The way that the registration works is there is a folder called plugins that uh, contains all the plugins. Uh, so let's make uh, EDU, Harvard, Catalyst, let's do, uh, call it a new folder called foo, because everybody who programs know what foobar means, foo. Uh, foobar, that's something that is in every single like programming book that I've ever read. It's just like a random thing that programmers say. Oh, it's a military thing. Okay, so maybe not. Oh, okay, never mind. Let's use a different word. <laughs> uh, so foo bar, that's different than the military term, even though it's pronounced the same way. Okay, makes a big difference because we're not the only thing. So uh, we have a folder here for the foobar uh, plugin. Uh, once we create that, we have the directory, but it's not going to show up because we have the plugins plugins file, which is uh, in the root of the plugins folder. This file lets you know what plugins are loaded. So let's go ahead and add that. That is going to be edu. Dot Harvard dot catalyst dot foo bar and that is going to now load it, but we're probably going to get errors because foo bar is empty and every plugin needs a plugin 
uh, JSON file within its main folder. So we can go ahead and should be able to copy that, paste that, and we'll edit it. And now within the foobar folder, we have got plugins.json, and this would be live plugin example. Uh, Something and uh, we don't need any categories, just kind of gunning this whole thing very quickly. We are going to have an assets directory, plugin version, sure, sure. And right here in the base, it's saying that we're going to need index.html. And if we wanted to authorize tunnels into uh, the main UI, we'll put something in here where you can do security checking on your plugins when you're importing them and see what they're getting access to. But since we don't need any elevated privileges, we'll just eliminate that. Okay, so save that. And it is referencing an index.html, new HTML file, index.html. And then we have hello world. And when we go ahead and come back into our um, system, we reload the browser, come back in with the analysis tools, and we are going to have live plugin example now registered. And when you click on that, we get our hello world. So this is running within an iframe now. Uh, if we look at it right here, you can see it's within an iframe. So let's do something cool with that. Uh, something that we're going to need to do is uh, probably pull in, uh, where did that other one go? Here it is. Uh, pull in some other assets. So let's uh, pull in some JavaScript which we will need um, several of, and some CSS. Uh, we don't need assets, that's just the pictures. So, catalyst example, foobar, paste. And what we're doing now is uh, we're adding uh, the other pieces of functionality. So this is what we just completed. We created a directory in the plugins directory. Uh, we added uh, that directory entry to the plugins JSON file. We created a plugins uh, JSON file configuration for that actual plugin. And now it is displaying in the main user interface. Next thing we should do is create the basic page, um, adding an asset directory, uh, set the base configuration, which we already did. And now we're going to be adding additional libraries for the visualization. Uh, the D3 library, Venn JavaScript library, and Bootstrap. So doing that, we see that we now have uh, CSS and the JavaScript, and we can add these, or we can just cut and paste that from here. And, oops, copy this. And when we're doing this, bringing it over here and putting it into the head, we are going to be importing uh, style sheets. So uh, the plugin CSS is just uh, CSS to make things pretty. Uh, bootstrap uh, is your basic bootstrap library. This is the important one right here, this loader.js file. Uh, the I2P2 dash loader JS file. And what that does is that's the key file that will communicate a very, um, very advanced uh, and robust dance. And it will continually load in support files from the main user interface. So as you're running this, 
it'll send information in telling you where the support files are, how to load them, and it brings in all the different functionalities that the plugins operate using, such as the drag drop functionality from the main UI, the ability to reach out to the server, uh, the ability to do secure tunnels, as well as uh, state management library. So all those are gonna be injected by that single loader file. Uh, and then we have a plugin.js file for our code. And then we're also importing uh, D3 and the Venn diagram. So if we get that saved, okay. And after saving that, we have these things ready and reload and we should have more data in there now so it looks the same hello world but if we go ahead <laughs> oh actually you're right the the font changed uh, so if we dig in there we go to the console and there's a way to actually select the console uh, you don't want to go to the top, which is the entire web application. You want to go down to this index one, and then that gives us within that highlighted area, gives us access inside there. And if we go I2B2, we can see that the I2B2 variable has been injected into your space for your plugin. So all of a sudden, with that one file, we now have a blank hello world that we have all the functionality needed to reach into the main I2B2 web client. And from this is where we start building uh, very cool applications and very cool visualizations. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, grab some more code here. Let me get, this is a new file. And this is going to be our plugin. JavaScript file. Oops, it should be. Okay, so it's already in there. Uh, okay, so uh, one of the things that we need to do is uh, we have the I2B2 plugin services now imported because we use this I2B2 loader JS file. In that, uh, we've had the environment created where we now have AJAX, the SDX system, the, mo the data model, state management, and authorized tunnel. And what we want to do is when I2B2 uh, ready event is called, that means that all of I2B2 is loaded and you can now start executing your code safely. And that would be this statement right here. We go ahead and just grab that put it here index and let's be a little hackish. Uh, And that is our script. And what temporarily get rid of that. And now when we run it, we should be able to reload now without uh, reloading the whole client. And there it is uh, saying that the I2B2 environment has been loaded. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next, we're going to look at drop handlers because what we're doing with this plugin, we need to accept some sort of data. If you recall the demonstration I did in the beginning, it takes patient sets and it actually opens those patient sets and looks at each individual patient identifier. And that patient identifier is then compared across all groups to see where that patient identifier comes up in other patient sets. So if one patient is existing in two patient sets, we need to kind of identify that in our model. And we'll get into that in a second. But for right now, let's grab drop handlers. The easiest way to do a drop handler is within this function right here. 
we are going to, I know alerts are very cool, but let's do something useful. And we are going to be using the I to B to attach type function and the uh, set custom handler function or set handler custom function. And we can go ahead and do that. So it's going to be I to B to uh, SDX attach type and the target for this is going to be document. So anywhere on that document body uh, that gets dropped, a, uh, a patient record set, a PRS record, um, it will now recognize when that drop event occurs. And of course, we need to do the handler, I2B2 SDX, and it is a set handler custom. Uh, once again, document body, uh, PRS data type, and this should be a drop handler. And there's other handlers that you can put there, but for this case, we're doing drop handler. And now we pass it a function on data dropped. So this is our function call and now I love alerts so much. So alert got a drop. And then from that, we are going to do uh, that uh, dropped. And then at that point, we should be printing what's been dropped. Uh, go back to the client, reload it. Uh, by coming here, pushing that through. And now if we go ahead and take one of our patient record sets, should accept a drop. Hold on one second. Ajax access. Uh, let me reload this. And analysis tools, I plug in our iframe patient record set and it looks like it wants to do something else today. Uh, so we can go ahead and just grab it from the other file. And it is going to be here at the bottom. Uh, And with this, we'll go ahead and give this another shot. Oh, running in test. Okay. Just one second. And run it this way. And now we have the analysis tool comes out, loads this, and now we should be able to take the patient set and drop. Oh, there it is. Because the document is tiny. So it's only hello world that accepts the drop. 
So we should probably make that larger, uh, make it height 100 or something. But uh, yes, so we have this. Uh, we'll go ahead and make a div to eliminate that, make div. Uh, actually, we can probably just speed this up by grabbing it from here. There we go. Prepackaged code and index. Change the body up. So the body is there. We still have the same script. And we have it so that when you use this, uh, it will now accept it in a much larger area. And when you drop it, it's a drop. And then here's the drop object. And this is the SDX object. This is the standard data format that we go ahead and uh, pass whenever you get stuff from the original data model. What you see with this, you see the render data, which is what it looks like, all the styles, the icons. Uh, you have the original data, which varies depending upon the data object that uh, data object type that is being passed. And the SDX info, which is a standardized set of information, which will give you all the information you need to look it up in the database and pull that data down. So let's jump into uh, a little bit more fancy code. So we've gone ahead, we've got these uh, uh, drop handlers that handle that drop operation. And now we're gonna do some shortcuts uh, and jump into some existing code. Uh, we're going to go ahead and set up the object model, um, which contains uh, i2b2.model, and then the data sets that we're going to be putting in. Um, so we've just created the drop handler. Now we need to get the patient's IDs. So what we're going to do is grab the function that is here. So uh, Venn diagram drop handler. And jump in here to index. Uh, we can see, there we go. When that is dropped, you want to put this drop handler code in there so that now we can extract the data. Uh, so SDX. And that SDX now is there. Now we can get rid of those test functions. And what we have now, so uh, when the event handler, uh, when the drop handler fires, we get the SDX object. The SDX object looks to see if there's something called an underlying package, which if you're dragging from the workspace into this, uh, allows you to identify the data, not the actual folder within the workspace. So we're looking for the data. Then we're going to take the model and in a function, in a section called metadata, we're actually going to put a record for that SDX object. So we're storing the SDX object. And that is going to work like this. Uh, so patient IDs. So this should all be ready. Live plugin example, grab this, bring that up here. And it's not setting. Oh yeah, I forgot this. Uh, we should remember to set up our data structures that we're gonna be saving stuff in. Uh, when the 
this is there. We initialize those data structures and then it should work. Reload it, fire it, and it's coming out. Yeah, so it accepted that. Now, if we go ahead and look at the console, looking at index, we're going to go I2B2 model. And within the model, we can see that there is now an object inside metadata. And this is the event, or this is the SDX object that was sent. So we dropped one item there. We can go ahead and take another uh, patient set, drop that patient set here. And if we go ahead and look at the model and its model metadata, we can see now that there are two records there for the two patient records that we've gone ahead and dropped. Uh, so that gets us the patient record sent, but we need to identify the actual patients themselves. Um, so let's do some server calls to get that information. Uh, we're going to be firing a request to get the list of patients. That's going to go uh, to the I2B2 backend using the I2B2 Ajax uh, data structure within the plugins environment. And we're going to specifically do a call to this function right here, this um, I2B2 Ajax CRC cell, the get PDO from input list. And since uh, all functions and interactions with the uh, main uh, fr support framework uh, work with promises, you're going to be able to use the simple then operator uh, to continue to process it. And your code's going to be so much cleaner than legacy stuff so it's going to work very nice so we have this we'll jump into plugin and what we're doing is for this particular case we have the drop handlers add prs function so we're going to swipe that real quick and put that in to the main bar app and we'll do that up here. So we have a function called add PRS, uh, add patient record set. And we're going to make it so that add PRS gets fired and passes in that key value in order to hit the server. Now, what's gonna happen when it hits the server? Uh, it's gonna say that there is no patient limit and that the actual PDO request is the following XML, which is going to uh, pull out the PR, uh, PRS identifier for that patient set. And then it's going to list out all the patients. That data then comes back as a string. It's gonna be interpreted by an XML uh, parser. And from that, we're gonna do an XPath query on it, or I think it's just a, a record location using tags. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and take uh, patient records and uh, get the information and start populating that into the data sets identifier. Uh, so we're going to start saving that information. And then these two come later, but we're also going to be saving the state because everything that is inside the I2B2 data model is going to actually be uh, saved when you do this I2B2 state save operation. So that pushes the data from the plugin, pushes it to a uh, main data store inside the main I2B2 UI. And execute that. And now when we run this, oh, that didn't take it. And we can go here down to that iframe and do i2b2.model. And we can see now that that data set uh, now has uh, all the records. So what it's done is the data set is a listing of all the patient identifiers. And uh, that patient identifier is going to have a set 
that contains the patient set ID that that patient is associated with. So I know it's getting a little bit complicated. So let's talk a little bit about the data structures that are being used to simplify this. Um, basically, we're trying to find out what patient belong, what patient set a patient belongs to, which cohort does the patient belong to. Uh, and in this case, we have three patients, uh, patient one, patient two, patient three. Patient one is a member of set one, two, and three. So he's three different cohorts. He's uh, uh, autistic, he's male, um, he's over the age of 25. That could be three example sets. Uh, patient two uh, is only a member of set three. So this is an individual that's only over the, page, uh, over the age of 25. And patient three would be uh, autistic and uh, male. So this is an example of uh, the data that we're actually building right now to run the calculation against. The next data set or the next um, uh, data structure that we need to use is visualizing all the sets in their intersections. And this is the format that the uh, Zen, or I'm sorry, the Venn diagram uh, is looking for in order to create the visualization that it creates. Uh, so you're going to give an array, and in that array, there's going to be all these different sets that it's running. So you have a set, or you have sets, and then within that array, it's going to be a listing of one or more sets that uh, is being identified and having a size, a uh, population size of 50 in these cases. Um, be represented within the visualization. Uh, you also are going to represent intersections of two sets, so set one and set two, male, female. Set one plus set two, meaning where male and female circles overlap, there's going to be a zero population there, so it's not going to, it's going to get close, but it should not show anything uh, overlapping in those two sets. So, now that we've got that set up right here, this is a data set, and let me add another uh, patient set. So we've gone ahead and run that. And if we look at our data set here, you can see that some of these patients now, these are patient identifiers on the left, and then the red numbers uh, here are going to be the uh, cohort sets that they are associated with. So we can see that uh, patient uh, 10 million 35 is a member of both those populations that we've dragged and dropped in. So we have the patient identifiers, we have the sets that they all belong to. Uh, the next step is to go ahead and render for the Venn diagram by setting it into this particular format. Um, and the way we do that is elegant, uh, but a little bit dense, and I'm not going to reproduce it here. So let's just cut and paste it real fast. Uh, let's see. So that is going to be calculate a recalc. And coming down here. This is going to be the recalculates function call. And we'll go ahead and inject that in to our code base. And change this just to recalc. So what we can do up here is go ahead and add this app recalculate. So after it receives a patient record set, it's going to hit the, hit the server, come back with the data. It's gonna then format that data into uh, this structure right here. And after it formats that data into that structure there, it's gonna perform a recalculation uh, right here, recalc. Uh, so running that recalculation, it's going to go ahead and clear the render data, which is our output data going into the Venn uh, JavaScript library. 
And this is all the fancy stuff that makes that math happen. Uh, we can see that after we're done with that calculation, we're gonna save once again so that we save our state as we are working on the data. Uh, it's saved incrementally. And we're going to do a little bit of rendering of data. And I think there's something missing, but I'm sure I'll find out pretty soon. And save that. Go ahead and run this again. Patient set one. So it goes ahead and creates that. Patient set two. It goes ahead and creates that. So those two things are being made, but we still don't have a diagram, uh, but we have the data and we have the data structured properly for render, I believe, at this point. So it is going to be I2, B2 model. Going into that, we can see that there's our data set with the patients. And we also have metadata, which is our objects that we were dragged and dropped. And now we have our render data. And the render data involves male autistic disorder, and then the intersection of those two. So if we can see here, the set is an intersection of both male and autistic disorder. Um, there and there. And this would be the combination of the two. Uh, 82 males, autistic disorder is 10. And then the intersection of both those two sets is going to be a size of seven. And it's done all this calculation. Um, and all we have to do now is take this render data and pass it on to the Venn diagram visualization. That would be here, so we have to set up the actual Venn diagram. So charts, D3, datum, um, and I think that would be it. So we just need to copy, in theory, just need to copy these few lines uh, to build the chart uh, with the height and width uh, we don't need to save reference. And the div. And then that's going to re render it. So the thing is, we should be re rendering this after each modification, after every recalculation. Uh, so this is the recalculation function. So at the bottom of this, we should go ahead and put the update, which I believe would be that. So one second, bear with me as I hunt down that one line of code. If you're familiar with programmers, we're always looking for just that one line of code. And it always seems to be there and then it disappears when we get distracted by a squirrel or something. Um, ah, there it is, redraw. So this is the if statement, save space, and this is going to be redraw. And just to make sure my scoping is correct, that should work. So we go ahead, Go back, reload it, drag that over, and we have it rendered. Uh, go ahead and take the second one, drag that over, and it renders. So that was uh, not too long. It was actually pretty fast, and we were able to do it. So I'm very happy that I could do that without too much chaos. But uh, yeah, there's some icons to be changed and stuff like that, but you get the idea. The whole reason I did this live uh, presentation, this live coding of this functionality, is to show you how easy it is 
and how much lifting has been done for you as a potential plugin developer uh, by just the framework. I mean, it's a single function call will get you to the server, get you back. You don't have to worry about authentication tokens or a login session identifiers or anything like that. It's all handled for you. There's so much lifting. Uh, this product was designed not only for clinicians and researchers to use, but it was also designed for developers. Uh, there's a lot of work that went into designing the proper API that really gives you guys the power to do what you can envision because the more people who can work with this, the better off it's going to be for the entire community. And that sums it up. Yes, uh, we, we do. We have time for questions. Uh, questions from anyone? Feel free to use the microphones. And I'll check online to see if there's any questions coming in that way. But I guess questions here about um, what you did or about the plugin framework, any of the above? Yeah, anything. Any questions? I don't have a question because it was really, really good. <clears throat> but I do have a, so um, we need a fix for something. <laughs> so the, the biggest hurdle that folks have when they use plugins with patient sets yes. is that they don't get the patient set when they do the query. They try to use a query, but they don't have a patient set associated with it. They just try to use the query. Yes. And they didn't get a patient set because they weren't. They didn't, they didn't really think about it. it. Yeah. But see, it's a solvable problem because you could just get the patient set dynamically. So if they drag a um, query which has no patient set, just mm -hmm. go do it, get the patient set, and then put the patient set. Yeah. I mean, I, in all truthfulness, I, not, I knocked out this, um, this entire plugin in about 20 something hours. So like I, it was a weekend hack thing that I just did and knocked out. So it is possible with a little bit more effort for me to not force the user to drag in just a patient set to be able to drag in a query master and then dig in to see if there's a patient set. So that's something that's possible. Um, you mean execute a new query? Yeah, execute a new query. Right, because you've got everything you need. You know what the query is. Yeah. You got the server sitting there is, waiting for a query. It'll now know to make a patient set because you can kind of tell it now, okay, bring, do a patient set. That you need a patient time. set. Yeah. And then there would be. Uh, so not all patients, depending on their role, need patient set or can get access to patient sets. Right. So, so there would be we that. need to do a security check. Which, Absolutely. Which well, should definitely happen in the main client. Yeah. Uh, it's a little. I don't know. Maybe we can add some functionality to do security checks in the plugin environment, so the plugins are capable of knowing that. Right. So so what I'm really thinking about is like not just this plugin, of course, but this. This is the most common thing I think people run into when they try to do, use a plugin in I2B2 mm -hmm. and they want to use a previous query. And 95% of all the query, all the plugins are doing this kind of thing, right? Where yeah. you're dragging a query in and you want the data back somehow, right? Either as a set of patients or data with the patients or something. The first step is always, right, you got to get the patient set back Correct. to do anything. But they don't know when they did the query that they had to get a patient set, either yeah. because they didn't anticipate they were going to do it or they just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so in the library, a big, and it's complicated, right, because yes, you got to make sure that they have the right, you know, that they're a uh, LDS or higher, right, to get the patient set back, but uh, they have to, you got to do something while you wait for the query to execute, right? So if, it's, if, if it doesn't have a patient set and it goes to do the query, mm -hmm. then it's going to take a while. Yeah. 
So it's going to, who knows how long. And it might fail. And um, the, uh, it, it, you know, it needs to know to then, okay, go back and get the patient set, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's that valuable that we should think about. I definitely don't disagree. I, just, I, I think that it is a usability issue um, and it's a ease of use issue. Um, but there's uh, multiple ways that we can accomplish that. Uh, some of them being technological, some of them uh, perhaps not being technological. Maybe it's training, maybe it's uh, messages that pop up when you're running queries or just changing the label next to patient set when you get a query and says, select this if you need analysis. So there's, there's many different ways, but it's something that should be explored because it is coming up as an issue and it's something that the population is experiencing. And I think as a community, uh, we need to uh, come up with a, a best solution. Uh, I know when you've got a, smart, a lot of smart developers in a room, uh, it's always a technology question and it's always, hitting it with the technology hammer um, and it's useful and it works but i think that like as a community it's affecting everyone so let's find out what everyone thinks in in managing that like user interaction analysis or something sure. but yeah we can do this what, what does everybody think actually uh, i agree that it's a very useful feature but it's also <laughs> yep and by the way, we do have a very extensive, I think it's something like 20 some page document that talks about how to develop your own plugins using a new framework. So feel free to hit that DOI and uh, download it. It's a nice PDF. Okay. Uh, so one thing is, I really wish I had this presentation before I started working on that plugin that I did. Because <laughs> this would have helped me a ton. But anyway, thank you. Very good presentation. Uh, but in regards to dragging it across, I agree that's a, it's a techni technicality is not that difficult. I think the biggest issues are going to be like, let's say we go to the new ontology of 4.1 and then the C full names change. Or yeah. if we reload the database and add more patients, all of a sudden there's now like 10 more patients in your patient set. Yeah. And, and so I think there's um, things of that nature that need to be, because if people don't realize what a patient set is, then all of a sudden they're getting 10 more patients. Yeah. Yeah, that's gonna even confuse them further. Well, well, but but I, think it, I think it could be done. It's just, I think we have to like, it could be as simple as, okay, you didn't create a patient set. Would you like to create one? Yes, it runs it. Oh, by the way, there's now 10 more patients in right. your set. Yeah. It could, all of this, we, we know XML, we could figure this all out. It's just, how do we explain it to the end user so it doesn't, make them more. <laughs> so. Okay, I have questions about the, um, the installing the ontology, the, the cell. So uh, as you know, the ontology store, I create a, a plugin using the, for the new UI using the new structure, which I show you. Yes. So right now we, we actually making a cell for it. And so with the new uh, plugin structure, is installing the cell the same as, as for the old structure? You say it's a, a new cell, like a top level cell? Yes. So now it's part of the hive. So how do we communicate? So um, if the cell has no visual uh, interactions, if it's not like making changes to the legacy uh, client's visual structure, then it should be able to go in there with its communication layer without any problems. Uh, and then you would use the uh, authorized tunnel uh, for your plugin that runs in the plugin environment to punch through to get to that new cell. Um, and that should work. If you've got other modifications to the UI, um, if you're using Yahoo user interfaces, <laughs> like you're gonna have problems with it, I'm sorry to say. But, um, you may need to redo the visual stuff, but like the entire communication layer has pretty much stayed the same. Okay. So actually, to that, how do you register a new device? I have this. Or do you 
offline. Yeah, I'm actually, it, it's been like 15 years since I made a cell, so like, yeah, it's, I, I need to look at that code again. Yeah, I, I tried to do that when I had some difficulties. Yeah, let's, let's uh, catch up offline on that. Oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, oh. go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, just question and comments. Uh, I'm kind of relatively new to the community. I just want to ask about, um, since you opened up this possibility you know, for people to develop plugins, so what's, what's the original vi vision? Like, um, do you know who, who are the people who are most motivated to develop plugins? And ha have you ever surveyed what's the most wanted um, functions people are looking for and what's the capabilities, the capacities of the, uh, the potential teams or groups who may be able to develop something, but, um, and you know, what's the incentives for them and how active is the development community? Those are sort of the high level questions I, I have. So some of, uh, I, I won't be able to answer some of that uh, just because I'm not in leadership for the I2B2 Foundation. Uh, some of those are more of the foundation's goals uh, to drive adoption. And uh, my, my goal is building a technology device uh, that allows you to build upon it in a very easy way. So I gave, I built the tools so that it can be, it, it can be done and you can attract people. But I think that some of that other stuff has to do with outreach uh, to the community, uh, passing surveys for individuals um, uh, that may be potential plug-in developers. Um, I mean, there's there's a whole group of other people. I'm not up here by myself doing this. It's it's the community in general as well that that uh, needs to take functionality like this that has been created, uh, that has made it easy for people to develop plugins. Um, I mean, I don't know, put $1,000 on Amazon gift cards and <laughs> make a hackathon. That's a way to get yeah. some activity. Yeah, I, I think my comment would be, uh, um, as I say, if I'm a developer, then I, I probably want to say, if, if there is something like so exciting, even uh, there are some hurdles I, I must overcome and I want to develop something from it, you know, because maybe the data is so valuable. If I add something and maybe the, there's active community and I can benefit a lot of people. But it's also a chicken egg uh, situation. Like um, maybe there is some barrier where people cannot fully leverage the, the value of data. And suddenly if you have some plugin and show showcase the value that uh, people can benefit, oh, this can be used in this way. And suddenly you may attract more users and if it's makes a positive feedback loop and uh, hopefully it just to be you no know, snowballing yeah more and more well i i i'm a fan of hackathons but then again i drink a lot of caffeine so probably <laughs> but um i i definitely think that some of the things that you said um not not all plugins can be developed with one person or one person's goal you kind of need uh, input from other people and being able to collect a team and maybe you got some programmers, somebody else has got an idea who's a clinician who, who knows how to use it and somebody else has an idea. Um, I think that in an environment like a hackathon or something like that uh, brings all the people together um, and gives them uh, an opportunity to create something new. So thank you. Thank you. I think we maybe have time for one more comment or yep. question because I know we've got some good stuff here. Just kind of follow up on that. You know, there, there, there probably are a lot of really great plugins that institutions have developed. I imagine like, almost every site has done integration with their local authentication or how are they getting data out. And so, but we don't know about a lot of these. Um, we had some great presentations today about things that sites have done, but we, there's a lot we don't know about what institutions have done. Um, we have a community wiki that has plugins that have been contributed, but some, a lot of them after a while, they're not supported anymore. And which are the ones that are going to be kind of more official plugins. 
But now that we have this new framework, it'll make it easier to develop these plugins and hopefully we'll figure out a better way of, of managing that. And uh, out of the comment I had specific to your plugin, if we're gonna develop a plugin that will go and call the backend to run a query, I don't know if you actually need the patient sets. You can just create a new query, which is two subqueries, query number one, query two, and do the and of them and get a count back without having to actually pull out patient sets from that. And that would allow you to give it to any user, not just users who have sort of patient set um, access. Yes. Actually, I like that idea. Yeah. You're that gonna have works. to run a bunch of queries. It might take a little bit, but at least you'll be able to, yeah. to do it. That's actually totally true. Yeah, that'll work. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.